In the world of dairy farming, bull calves are often disposed of due to their perceived lack of commercial value. But in the heartlands of Pennsylvania, where rolling hills and beautiful landscapes converge, one farmer has changed this narrative. Join us as we take a journey into Dan's farm, a place that not only sustains the body, but also nurtures the soul. I was born into it. My family we were farmers, grandparents and great-grandparents so this is how I grew up and I enjoy it and had a good life when I was a kid and my kids like it and you know their friends come over and get to run around and do all kinds of stuff here and also learn how to feed animals and work. This farm has a remarkable legacy that stretches back to the days of William Penn the founder of the state of Pennsylvania. <laughs> this, this is the real America Yep, all the rest, the rest of America was built off of this America. The farm has seen generations of hardworking people toiling on its fertile land to provide for their families and the surrounding community. The benefits are you get, you get money which helps you pay for all this and but also you don't make that much money if you keep track of your time per hour like at a regular job. So you have to love it as much as you want to make money doing farming. The farm is divided into three sections representing the various stages of the calf's life. In this barn we have about 85 every year at the last stage of their life. Um, then we have an adolescent stage which is about a mile and a half down the road on another farm like the teenager stage and then we have about a half mile away the very small stage which is the babies and they move from farm to farm until they end up here and and uh, then this is their last stop so typically if we add all of the beef up that we have we usually have about ooh, probably 500 a year this particular structure you see behind me is for the young animals. They are just about a day, two, three, less than a week old. So they are collected from the, the farms around here. The first section of the farm is home to the youngest calves. The section, lovingly cared for by Paddy, herself a seasoned farmer. We buy them as little tiny babies and they're like a day old when we get them and we raise them until we fatten them and then we sell them as fat animals and we raise about 80 a year to fatten and then we sold like 65 feeders this fall because we had too many they're pit they're out on pasture and um till they get to be bigger and then they go over to dan's house and then they get corn and silage but out here they just get pasture and grain paddy is a kind-hearted woman in her early 60s I, I grew up on a farm with my mom and dad. I've always lived on a farm and I, I just always loved it. We used to come home from school and as soon as you got home from school you changed your clothes and you went to the barn. And I always hoped I could do that until I died and I think I'm going to. Because <laughs> I'm like 62 now and I'm still doing it. <laughs> Are these from Jesse? She possesses a wealth of knowledge and experience in nurturing these delicate creatures. Yeah. Uh, I like this little red one here. He's so cute. The babies get milk twice a day. Yeah, you said you get them only about a day old. Where do you get them from? From neighborhood farms. I get I have like four farmers I get them from that have I used to milk over there with dairy cows, so I know the neighbors pretty good and we just go and buy them from them because most of them don't want to raise the boys so that's why we get the boys they raise the girls for replacements but the boys they don't want she grew up on the farm and loves farming what do they feed on oh they um the babies have we buy their feed for them milk replacer and special calf feed because there's medicine in that calf feed there that's why we buy it but once they get a little bigger like when they get the size out there in the calf lot then um, we just give them the corn that we grow 
we grind it up and, and feed them that and hay that we also grow in Beale. But, um, yep. And then when they get real big and they get to dams, then they get silage too and corn. But, yep, we grow most of what they eat except when they're tiny like this. Then you have to have special feed or else because it has medicine in for them. She takes great pride in her role as the calf surrogate mother, ensuring that they are fed on nutritious diet of milk and pasture. And then buying them young, you don't feel like they'll die or what do you normally do for them to not to die? Oh, well, as long as they have colostrum from their mom before we get them, they're usually in good shape. But once in a while, we get some that don't have the colostrum and then it's a fight. <laughs> it's a fight till they either decide to live or they decide to die, but yep. Yeah, we give them medicine and stuff, Draxin mostly, if we have to, but hopefully not. Mostly if, they're, if they had colostrum, they'll make it, mostly. As the calves grow bigger and stronger, they transition to the next stage of their journey. Here, the adolescent calves are provided with special care, guiding them as they learn to graze on the grasslands and explore their expanding world. Holsteins take about two years till they're here and gone, but like the Angus crosses, the black ones and the Charlay over at Dan's, they're only here about a year and a half. They grow really fast compared to a Holstein. When the calves reach the fattening stage, they are transferred to another section of the farm where they are cared for by Dan and his wife, Daniela. On the beef farm, we have Holstein, Black Angus and Charlay. And when they're young, they eat pasture, which is grass and hay. And then when they get older and it's time to fatten them up, then we feed them silage, which is, which is this, corn stalk, corn, everything ground together, and a mixture of just straight corn. Dan is a second generation farmer with deep rooted connection to the land. His grandfather acquired the land after returning from World War II. His grandpa came out of the, what, army? Or what was it? Yeah. And he, that's exactly what he did. Right, my grandpa fought in World War II and with the GI Bill, when the war was over, he used that money to purchase his first farm, which was I think 120 acres and then built it off of that. This is because he sensed the beautiful possibilities the land had to offer. In that section of the farm, the bulls are gradually introduced to a diet rich in grains, ensuring their robust growth. The farm sees an annual production of approximately 85 bulls, which are either sold to close-knit neighboring communities or offered at auction to the wider public. When the beef's ready here, then we load it up in the chute onto the trailer, which is on the other side of the barn, and then we take it about five miles down the road to an Amish butcher, and he butchers it and then the people go down there and pick it up. We don't advertise, it's just word of mouth, and we sell about 45 beef every year just to people, local, you know, York, close by that's, you know, wants it. And then the remaining 40 or 50, we take to Lancaster to auction for restaurants to buy and things like that, but we, before we take it to auction, we like to sell it to, you know, people that, you know, like you or, or, you know, other friends of mine or my wife's or, you know, the kids' parents' friends, you know, we'd rather sell to them first. So it's just word of mouth and give me a call and <laughs> hook you up. The farm takes pride not only in its produce, but also in its sustainable practices. This isn't technically grass fed. The main reason that people like grass-fed is because um, the bigger beef houses, they use hormones and non-natural things, you know, feed and things like that, antibiotics, all kinds of stuff. And here we use, I mean, basically the same thing as grass. It's all grown here on the farm and so it's all natural, just the same as grass. The animal feed required for the bull's diet is carefully cultivated on the farm itself, ensuring both quality and self-sufficiency. As you can see, 
uh, this is uh, corn. Uh, they call it yellow corn. When winter arrives, the corn stalks harvested from the fields are utilized to keep the animals warm and dry, creating a cozy haven in the colder months. Dan, Daniela, and their children proudly continue the legacy of farming on the land. Like my daughter loves living here in the cows. But she has a hard time because she knows that they're beef cows and they're being raised to turn into food. Some people that feel that way um, have gone the other way and started raising uh, dairy cows for cheese, like who are, like Jared and them. Mm -hmm. And they've made like really good m money in that, you know, in that field. While Dan has inborn farming expertise, Daniela embraces the life of her farmer through her unwavering dedication and support for her husband's passion. I wouldn't consider myself a farmer because I married Dan, so I didn't grow up with this, you know, I'm a teacher and I just help on the farm and feed the cows, but in the summer, um, I think one of the biggest benefits is someone that looking in that hasn't been raised on the farm with the animals. I feel like a lot of people think that if you're a beef farmer, like that's almost cruel, but it, seeing the kids living here, like we love the cows. They name all the cows and like when they're, when they're little, like it's a very nurturing, like loving relationship between the farmer and the cow. It's not, you know, what a lot of people envision in their heads. And the, the cows have like a great life. You can see them out there in the, in the meadow and seeing the kids just interact with the animals and play with the animals and learn how to drive tractors and learn how to, you know, it's just such a benefit to to see like as parents to raise your kids on a farm and teach them how to work and drive equipment and do all those different things and also just get that different perspective of you know what a farmer is and what a farmer does. Together they have created a harmonious environment where they also keep chicken. So we started incubating eggs so we're gonna make two little stations out here for like when they're smaller because you can't put them together right away. So our chickens are just for for eggs. We don't we don't eat them or anything. Do you know what an incubator? Yes, I know. Okay. Yeah. So the difference is in Africa we have those who have incubators, uh -huh. but most of us they just lay, uh, let the chicken lay, uh, lie on the eggs for okay. the for the period until the chicks hatch. Okay. Yeah. So in most cases we don't use incubators, especially in the rural areas. Beyond their own farming endeavors. Dan and Daniela embody a spirit of encouragement and inclusiveness. When asked whether immigrants could fulfill their dreams of becoming farmers, Dan shares his wisdom with a warm smile. For a migrant coming to want to farm in the USA, you'll have to start with some money so that you can purchase some land um, or start small and grow your business into, um, you know, a bigger farm like this uh, it, because that is starting out you know if I was lucky enough to be raised in it from my family so but it would cost a lot of money to you know to just start and want to farm right off the bat you know without you know having somebody else starting it for you. He believes that with diligence and perseverance anyone could aspire to become a farmer. He inspires immigrants to save their earnings and invest in their own land, laying the foundation for our future in farming. And a lot of people that I know that are around our age that wanted to get into farming, but weren't fortunate like Dan that had a farm family, they started out by just working on someone's farm. Like they were the farm hand. So they, they were paid to help work and then they learned how to do all of the things. And then they bought a house with a little land and got a couple cows. And then they got, you know, so they just started, like he said, real small and just working on someone's farm. So I think if you'd want to do that, that would be how you'd do it. You'd work on someone else's farm first and learn the trade and see how it works. And then start with like a couple cows, you know, just to kind of like set it up. As seasons change, the farm continues to be a pillar of the community providing sustenance and knowledge to generations of locals. Oh, they, they love to do it, but they, they, it's hard to fit it into their schedule anymore. 
you know, like, like Dan's kids, they love to do it and they help on the weekends and stuff. But when we bale hay and stuff in the summer, they all come around to help do it. It's a, it's a big family thing then. When we bale hay and straw, they, they always come and help us because it, it's my brother and I, but I'm 62 and he's 68. So it's harder for us to do things than it used to be. And the young ones pitch in and help us. And Dan and um, Dave's son is a little older than, a little younger than Dan. And he helps over the summer when he's not teaching school. So we, we have our help because we do need it. <laughs> and there's a, young, there's a young kid that was helping us when we were doing the corn out here. He didn't grow up on a farm or anything, but um, he helped us down in the parlor. We used to pay him to help down there. And um, he still comes around now that he has another job. He comes around cause, just because he likes to do it. Every year, the farm remains a testament to the rich history of York, Pennsylvania, where hardworking souls find solace in the land and a bountiful home. My name is Bonventure, and this is Moving Pictures Kenya, connecting people, inspiring Africa. <laughs>